Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. We've got a really exciting lesson for you and it's all about traits. Let's quickly define what we mean by traits. Now, traits are there to declare a certain behavior by having function signatures inside each trait and then letting each concrete type expand on that behavior. This is a quite a mouthful for a uh, definition. Uh, think of traits basically as just an adjective. It describes a certain object or a person. In our instance here, of course, it will describe classes and object types. Now, once you group all these function signatures within the trait itself, you are essentially defining a specific behavior without implementing each function signature in a concrete way. Instead, what you do, you are delegating that specific implementation to the concrete type itself. And what I mean by concrete type is the object itself will implement and expand on that function signature. Now, to declare the trait, it is very straightforward. Use the trait keyword, and then you start defining the function signatures. Let's take a quick look at a very simple example that we are going to implement later on with code. Now, what you see here is a trait called vehicle. And vehicle, of course, it can be cars, motorcycles, boats, or trains. But they all have one thing in common, and it is the calculate fuel left and displaying the fuel left. The key here is that we are describing a common behavior among these vehicles. Now, the specific implementation will differ depending on the concrete type. So, in the case of displaying the fuel left, you'd have vehicles that would probably display it in an analog fashion and other vehicles that would display it in an electronic fashion, let's say an LED, for example. Now, as you can see, to declare a trait, as I mentioned, it's very simple. You just use the trait keyword and then the name of the trait and the curly braces, and then you put the function signatures in there. Okay, now moving on, I'm creating a, a car struct and it will have two fields, which is fuel tank capacity and fuel consumed. And for the simplicity of this exercise, I'm keeping everything as an I32 there. Now, here is the interesting part. I'm going to start implementing the trait called vehicle for the car struct. And the way I do that is using the implement keyword, which we are all familiar with, and the name of the trait, and then the keyword for, and then the actual struct name. I'll start implementing implementing the calculate fuel left function and just do simple calculation nothing too clever i am not going to include speed or distance or uh, mile per gallons or anything like that i'm just going to subtract fuel tank capacity minus the fuel consumed now the second function i will declare here and try and implement from the trait itself is display fuel left and all it does is just prints the fuel left in the screen interesting part here is that it just reuses the calculate fuel left function that we've used at line 12. Okay, so let's put everything together and then uh, run the program. So as you can see here at line 23, I'm calling display fuel left. And then as you can see here on the far right, it will display the correct figure on the terminal. Okay, so let's make this a little bit more interesting. Let's declare another vehicle. So in this case is, a, is another vehicle called motorcycle. I'll use the same variables, fuel tank capacity and fuel consumed. And then I'll do the same thing as I did at line 11 which is implementing the trade vehicle for motorcycle and for the calculations I'll do the same here at line 27 and then display the fuel left at line 30. It's, it's going to be the same implementation. And then, of course, I'll go back to my main function, declare the uh, motorcycle struct there and display fuel at line 40. OK, so this is fantastic. We've just implemented two functions for two different vehicles using traits. However, as you can see, we are duplicating code here. So if you look at the fuel, left function, the one that displays the fuel left on the screen, it has the same implementation. All I'm doing is print LN. Well, I can take this up to the trait itself and have what we call a default implementation. And now the interesting part in this default implementation, it will reuse the function called calculate 
few left at line two in its implementation. So really your concrete types like a car and motorcycle, they just need to implement the calculate few left and then call the display few left automatically. Okay, so let's give this a go and see what happens. I'm removing the code here and running it in main. And just to show you, I have purposefully changed the fuel tank capacity for the car and the motorcycle. Just when we print it, you will see the difference there. Basically, just to summarize what we've done here, we first describe the behavior as a trait with those two function signatures. And then we implemented that behavior in concrete types. So in our case, for car and motorcycle. But let's try and do something more interesting. What if I wanted to use vehicle as a parameter for a function? So as opposed to me calling the direct concrete type display function, I'd like to have just a generic function that takes a vehicle as a parameter and then we'll call the display few left on any vehicle that I will give it. Okay, so what we've done so far is also called polymorphism. Computer science and programming, when polymorphism is involved and you're sending an interface as a parameter, for example, in, or in our case, a trait as a parameter to a function, there still needs to be a decision on which specific type to call. And that is called dispatch. In Rust, there are two major forms of dispatch, and it is static dispatch or trait bounds in the Rust terminology and dynamic dispatch, which is a trait objects. Just to define what static dispatch and more specifically what trait bounds means is that when you have a function parameter as a trait, what the compiler will do, first of all, it will know what sort of types you'll be calling. It will do something called the monomorphization, uh, which essentially it will write in line a function within your code for each type that exists. So in our case, it will create a function for or car and motorcycle. What that means is that your code will be much faster, but your binary will be also much larger. Now, dynamic dispatch will be the decision on which type to call will be done at runtime. And there is a cost to that. The binary is smaller, of course, but there is a cost to that dynamic dispatch to decide which type to call. Okay, so let me illustrate this with a good example here. We are going to uh, create a function at line 30 called report fuel left. And all it does really just kind of takes the manual functions that we uh, created at line 35 and line 38 and prints the fuel left. Now, the interesting part here is that it is taking a trait as a parameter. And there is probably a couple of things here that you're not familiar with. You're familiar with the ampersand, which is a reference. Now, dyn, dyn, that's for dynamic, is essentially how we define what trait objects are. And then vehicle is your trait. So what I'm telling the compiler here is make a decision at runtime on which type to call. Now, what we've seen here at line 30 is that the function takes a trait object and this essentially leverages the dynamic dispatch that we mentioned earlier. So behind the scenes, it will look up a given method at runtime and then calls that method. Of course, as I mentioned, this also will have a performance hit on your program. So let's try and call this function at line 40 and 41. And we'll use a reference because of course we declared the two concrete types at line 34 and 37. And so we'll just refer to them with the ampersand with the reference essentially. Okay, fantastic. So as you can see that prints successfully. Now let's move on to trade bounds. So with the trade bound, you can use the implement keyword in the function parameter, this might be confusing, right? I mean, usually we see the implement keyword for implementing a, a struct or something like that or a trait itself. But this time in the function parameter itself, we're seeing the implement keyword and then the actual trait. And this is just a syntactic sugar for a more traditional way of declaring generics with the where keyword. So as mentioned earlier, trait bounds, use static dispatch, and this will create this monomorphization that I mentioned earlier. Basically, after the compilation and the creation of the binary, you will see that your code will actually contains multiple functions for the different types.
So in our case here, for example, it will be report few left underscore car, report few left underscore motorcycle. So when should you use trait object versus trait bounds? Well, most of the time I'd say probably you can get away with trait bounds, but there are some cases where you need trait objects for example, if you're doing a conditional return from a function at compile time, it's very difficult for the compiler to know which function will be returned because the input for that particular function could have been done at runtime. So in this case, trait objects would be absolutely perfect. That decision can be done at runtime. Now, another good example of where using trait objects is a good idea is if you have a collection and you want to put multiple types in there. And we'll see both examples. Okay, so let's start with a simple example here at line 35. I'm creating a function that generates a vehicle based on the number of wheels that we enter as a function parameter. It's a very simple example here, but it's just to illustrate that conditional aspect and why you should use trait objects objects as opposed to trait bounds. Now you'll probably see there is a, a strange keyword here. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but if you're not, I'd highly recommend looking up what box is. It's basically just a pointer in the heap. And the reason why we use a pointer in the heap, remember, even though trait objects, uh, all the decisions are made at runtime, we still need to have a size and box returns a pointer which has a specific size. So at line 36 here, we're using a match to decide whether we want two wheels or four wheels. If it is two wheels, then return a box of a motorcycle. If it is four wheels, return a box of a car. And both the return values there at line 37 and 38 create a reference to the specific types, motorcycle or car. And of course, we have our default catch-all case there. That needs to be there, otherwise the program won't compile. Okay, now at line 52, I call that function with two as the number of wheels. And then at line 53, I'm just going to call that function. And you will notice here that the return value would be 20 for the motorcycle fuel left. As you can see, we've defined it at line 37. So now if I were to change this back to, for example, to trade bound, it would not work. All right, very quickly here, let me just do four wheels as well, just to make sure that fuel tank capacity of 50 would be returned, which essentially means a car. Perfect. Now, as you can see, if I wanted to use a trade bound i'll just have a return of implement vehicle there as you can see at line 35 and straight away the compiler is complaining is saying expected struct motorcycle found struct car okay so let's move on to the second example here where trait objects are extremely useful so at line 55 i'm declaring a vector that takes trait objects of vehicles. Since I've declared this as a trait object by using box and the uh, DYN keyword there and then the trait name, I'll be able to add a car and a motorcycle in the same collection. I wouldn't be able to do that with trait bound. Of course, after I do this, there are a couple of changes that we need to do to our functions here. This resulting vector at line 55 will iterate through it and then call the report fuel left function at line 30. However, this function now needs to take a reference to this trade bound. I'm leaving it as is, right? So you can see that you can actually uh, intermix. You can have the collection using trait object, but the function itself, for example, function at line 30, you can still have it calling a trade bound by static dispatch. Okay, so I've made a change at line 30. I also need to make the change at line 49 and line 50 there. So that way the value is not moved into those functions. And then at line 56, I simply iterate through the vector and then call calculate few left for each trait object in the vector. Another way to achieve the same thing as line 55 
Since we have declared car and motorcycle at line 43 and 46 respectively, we can just have a reference to them. So there is no need for box since we already created it. And by adding the ampersand, that will be a reference. We can also remove the type box there. You remove the boxing of collections from line 55 and add the reference there. Okay, so if we can give that a go now, fantastic. And with that, we bring our lesson to a close. Thank you so much for following us, and uh, I'll see you next time.